Well, hello and welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us for 21st Century Medical Missions Live. My name is Patrick Coughlin, Vice President of Partner Engagement for MBF, coming to you live from Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, on behalf of MBF, we'd like to welcome you to our discussion tonight about what's driving changes in the world of medical missions. Sorry, we're running a couple of seconds behind tonight. We've had some pretty nasty storms blowing through here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was a little worried I was going to be losing my internet connection. Uh, today, by the way, is July 21st, 2020, and the 13th episode of Medical Missions Live. Joining us from our global headquarters in Houston, Texas, is Andy Mayo. He's the CEO of MBF. And uh, we're trying to get, uh, again, weather is kind of playing a few problems with us tonight. We're working on getting our special guest on the line with us. That's Dr. Paul Osteen, who's a missionary and associate pastor at Lakewood Church, also in Houston. Now, I don't want you to worry because Andy and Paul are both in Houston. They are more than six feet apart. I think they're actually more than six miles apart. So uh, that's, um, uh, that's really great. Andy, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, I'm assuming Paul will be with us shortly. Well, we're trying to, we're trying to figure out. He's somewhere out in the, in the uh, out there in the Zoomosphere. <laughs> and uh, we're trying to figure out how to get him on so that he can talk. Well, so he, his, bo his box popped up for a second there, and then he disappeared. So, just just remember when you uh, when you're invited to MBF to be on Medical Missions Live, we might not let you talk. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, it's like uh, let's see. I think he's going to be able to join us now. Uh, while we wait for him, Andy, and as we kind of get that worked out, uh, just make a couple of uh, uh, comments to get us rolling here. Um, you know, sometimes we get questions about how the MBF Global Ministry compares to the ministry of U.S. churches. Well, first and foremost, MBF is a global ministry, right? Uh, and to that end, we'd love to know where in the world you're joining us from. So if you're um, uh, in Denver or Philly, uh, just put it in the chat comment. We'd love to know who you are and where you're joining us from as we uh, get our discussion going here. So we get a lot of questions from churches about um, how our partnership in ministry compares to that of local churches. And some people say, hey, we support a free medical clinic in our community. Does that compare with our international church partners and what they're doing in medical mission ministry? Well, that's a great question. Uh, MBF partners with churches in developing countries to equip them to develop long-term sustainable medical ministries. But because of the need in these countries, the scale of ministry is much larger than what a typical US church might take on. So instead of just supporting a local free care clinic financially, Imagine your church owned three or four major hospitals and a couple of nursing schools and 20 primary care clinics all around your state. That's the magnitude of our shared MBF medical mission ministry in developing countries. And during our 57 years of ministry together, we've developed church-owned medical networks in 32 different underserved countries. And these networks are key to providing medical care to individuals and families, in fact, entire communities. In other words, your ministry through MBF brings healing and hope to the hurting and the hopeless. And so we'd like to thank you for your partnership with us, Mary Ann in Texas, Jack in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Liz in Los Angeles, and Rawls, as always, in Birmingham, Alabama. Good to have you with us again tonight. Andy, um, we have a, 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 a quick update here on COVID, but let's introduce our special guest. Patrick, this is the greatest, the greatest one ever, the best week ever. I <laughs> promise you every time. Uh, we are really pleased to have joining us uh, tonight, Dr. Paul Osteen. Um, some of you may not know Paul personally, but uh, let me go back to all the way back to when he was just. A, uh, well, you want Patrick? You want to do the COVID update, and then I'll give you a quick week. Tonight, we don't have much of an update on COVID from around the world. Uh, the situation pretty much the same as it's been for the last couple of weeks. 
Um, in most of our countries, it's not quite as bad as sort of the d dire predictions. Not everybody, there's not people dying by the thousands, but it's still rolling through the population. And in most of the, the countries where we work, um, they have really inadequate testing. So they're not even sure how many cases they have, uh, whether they have people who are tested positive or you know, just uh, young people that are not feeling well. Um, in, so a number of the countries, they, they do have people who are beginning to come to the hospital who are sick, they're treating them the best they can. One piece of really good news, uh, Tumatumo Hospital, uh, just about, oh, 50 miles outside of Nairobi. Uh, this week, they are opening their brand new ICU, uh, three-bed ICU with a um, isolation room. Uh, they just sent us pictures, and uh, it looks fantastic. Uh, so we really are thankful for God, thankful to God and a couple of uh, very generous uh, individuals um, here in the United States for helping them uh, make that happen. But tonight, our guest, um, so by virtue of going all the way back to his childhood, uh, his undergraduate and medical tra school training were at Oral Roberts in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, he completed his general surgery uh, residency at the University of Arkansas uh, and practiced general vascular surgery in Little Rock. So he was a successful surgeon. One day after 17 years, decided that... Uh, God was calling him uh, to the ministry. So he moved to Houston and put himself to work at Lakewood, Lakewood Church, where he's only the associate pastor and sometimes teaching pastor, and then spends, what, four or five months a year doing surgery in developing countries. And because that wasn't enough, several years ago started the M3 Mobilizing Medical Missions Conference that happens every January and has become a major national conference uh, for medical, um, uh, people interested in medical missions uh, around the country. So welcome, Paul. It's great to have you with us. It's good to be on the show with you and Patrick. So thank you so much, Andy. I appreciate MBF and all you guys are doing. Oh, it's amazing. Hey, so start us off, give us a little commercial just about M3. It's sort of one of your favorite little things to do uh, when you're not busy doing anything else. Yeah. So tell us about M3. Well, you know, just a little bit about myself, Andy, I think will contextualize it. You know, I, I practiced general vascular surgery for years. God called me down here to Houston to help at our church. But now for the last 13 years, I spend three to four to five months a year and the niche that I, I serve, Andy, is I relieve missionary surgeons when they need a break. So I, I go and I relieve somebody. Like last time I went, I relieved a missionary surgeon so he could be with his brother who was ill in New Zealand. And it was just great for these surgeons can, who can trust somebody to, to, so to speak, run the hospital while they're gone. So that's kind of the niche that, you know, has been on my heart. And I have been doing that for many, many years. But um, one time I was finishing up three and a half months out in a mission hospital on the western side of Zambia, on the Zambezi River overlooking Angola. And I'd finished three and a half months and I was ready to come home, been very busy there. And as I was leaving, one of the surgeons from Lusaka came out to visit and he said, Paul, do you realize you're, you, you've been the only qualified surgeon in an area the size of Louisiana for the last three and a half months? And boy, Andy, that just, Patrick, that just struck me that I know how big Louisiana is. And I think about, you know, all the young women across those floodplains that get, you know, have difficult labor and can't get the baby out, need a C-section and can't get a C-section. And, you know, if they pass away, Andy, they're not going to be on anybody's statistics or books. So anyway, I had that thought in my mind. And then all, 36 hours later, I was fly, flying into Houston and I could overlook the Houston Medical Center, the largest medical center in the world, where there are 2,500 mission, excuse me, 2,500 doctors in one zip code. And so I felt like God just impressed on my heart, what would happen if you put the great needs of the world together with the great abundance that we have over here? And that was the genesis, really, of the Mobilizing Medical Missions Conference. And what we try to do is connect people that have a heart to help people in developing countries as far as uh, medicine's concerned. You know, we're a, we're a different tribe, and we're a, we're a 
de uh, definitely a, a group of people that share the same heart and you get those people together and it's just great Andy like you and I've had fellowship we we speak the same language because you know we're the same tribe so it's just a great time to connect people who have a heart to serve in that way second thing is let them be inspired by speakers who come from all over the world and I tell everybody, Andy and Patrick, we don't get speakers that have theories. We get people that have their fingernails dirty and they're knee deep into the needs of the world, around the world. And these missionaries and these uh, global leaders, they come and speak for us. And so people can be inspired as they hear these people. But then the other thing is that we have an opportunity to, for people to find their mission. And MBF will be represented in our big exhibit hall as well as 90 other exhibitors. And very often, uh, Andy and Patrick, people will be walking around that exhibit hall, and all of a sudden, God will begin to tug at their heart. This is the spot where perhaps I can serve God in, in medical missions. So really, that's the genesis behind the Mobilizing Medical Missions Conference, and it's our sixth year this year. We've had great success, and mostly because we have good people like you, Andy, and MBF, and other great organizations that have come alongside us. You know, one of the, just to reinforce that, at the, one of the last M3, con M3 conferences, I talked to several different nurses. I mean, and it was almost verbatim the same thing each one said. And that was, well, I really have a heart for going and do something. I'm just not sure how to get connected. Yeah. And so it's a wonderful place for people that have a heart, have an interest to sort of stick their toe in the water and say, if I wanted to do something, where could I go and how can I get connected? Yeah. So let me jump over. So I, I'm trying to figure out, you work at Lakewood. <laughs> uh, now, here's a, here's a person, can I ask you a personal question? Absolutely. Are, are you the older brother or is Joel the older brother? I'm the older by eight years. Oh, okay. So now we know, okay. So now I just want to make sure we had that right. So now I was going to ask you how you managed to find a, a position that says, you know, we want you to, we're, we're going to let you go off for four or five months a year. How do you handle that? Yeah, that's a really great question. And th the answer, Andy, is that it evolved over time. Uh, I was in charge of missions for years at Lakewood. And I was also, because of the, just a quick transition transition between my dad and Joel, they're, they're, I, I just offered a lot of oversight and stability to the ministries during the period of time that there was that transition, but we grew so fast, we had to hire people. And I, as I've told you, Andy, I hired people that was that were better than I was. And pretty soon all these high capacity leaders are just percolating to the top. And that's when, you know, I talked to Joel and he said, Paul, go as long as you want. And so I do missions now uh, four or five months of the year. The rest of the time I'm on the teaching and the pastoral staff there at Lakewood. And, you know, it works for me. Only God could have orchestrated it like this. And so it's not for everybody, but I, I feel like I kind of bridge the world between pastoral ministry and uh, medical missions. And really, uh, they used to call me a pastor surgeon when I was practicing little, in Little Rock. So I really pretty much do the same thing now. Well, Patrick often tells me that I can go off as long as I please. And, but it's not in the same tone, I don't think. Um, well, I was, I was going to say that you followed that example and have hired a whole bunch of people better than you as well. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have said anything better myself. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for serving that up, Paul. <laughs> yeah. So you've been traveling for many years. Um, what are some of in the places where you go and serve? Yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges uh, that you see? Oh, that is such a good question, Andy. I think, um, you know, it's so layered. I was talking to Rich Stearns from World Vision one time, and he said something to me that stuck with me. He said, poverty is rocket science. What he meant by that is a lot of times we'll say, well, it's not rocket science, but it is so layered. I mean, it is so multi-layered, the, the, just, the, just the situation of poverty. And, you know, so I see lack of infrastructure, I see lack of health care, I see lack of supply chain, I see lack of access, I see lack of roads, I see, you know, lack of medicines, as I said, the supply chain. So really, especially in you, when you get in the remote areas, um, you know, sometimes you get fairly good um, care in the urban areas, but if you get in the remote areas, the really hard to reach places, that's where it seems to all break down. And that's where people, you know, 50 miles can separate them from life and death. 
And very often, Andy, they can't make that because they have to take an ox cart or they're too sick to take an ox cart. They just pass away in their in their village. And so I think that it's just a multi-layered from all the way from governmental to supply chain to lack of access to health care. It's just a it's just the whole whole um, whole problem of poverty in the rural areas. And let me just tell you a, another story that really blessed me several years ago. I was talking to somebody from USAID, and you know they give a lot of money to help with a lot of problems around the world. And so this gentleman wanted to talk to me, and I kind of put off the conversation for a while. Eventually, we connected, and and he began to tell me where he worked. And all of a sudden, I realized he didn't just work in Nairobi and the big cities; he worked in the rural areas. And so all of a sudden, he began to realize that's where I worked as well. And he said something to me that really I think blessed me as far as just my Christian being a follower of Jesus. He said, Paul, if we want to get help to the people in the urban areas, we give it to the NGOs. But if we want to get help to the people in the remote areas that really need it, we give them to the, give it to the Christians because the Christians are willing to go that last mile. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Andy, I, and Patrick, I work out in those areas that are very remote. And so what I see is just lack of access to basic necessities of life and especially healthcare. Well, so our theme over the last several months has been the future yeah. of medical missions. That's our, our consistent theme that we're talking about various pieces and parts. Uh, but from your perspective, you are very uniquely uh, equipped mm -hmm. to have seen, seen over there, seen over here, seen multiple places. What do you see as the major trends? What's going to change in the next 10 years? Uh, yeah, well, that's another great question. I don't know if I'm an expert, but I can give you, I wrote down some thoughts and ideas. I'm very um, encouraged, Andy and Patrick, by this next generation coming up because they are very interested in social justice issues and they see the lack of basic health care as a, as a social justice issue. And the thing about this next generation is they don't just want to give their money to causes. They want to give their lives to, lives to causes. So to me, that's a trend I think that we're going to see that, you know, young people with that are bright and energetic and passionate and creative and they have all this technological, you know, uh, knowledge. I think them coming on the scenes is very, very much in, very encouraging to me. And I, I suspect that with their creative minds and with their abilities, they're going to help propel us forward. But I think that one of the things I think that we all have to be cognizant of though, Andy, and this is what MBF is so good at, I think we've got to, to put our, our eggs in the basket of sustainability. We can't just go over and pass out pills. We've got to, we've got to create or be a part of institutions that will be there long after we leave. And so I think, I think the, 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 kind of the future I see is that, that if it's not sustainable, we probably should not be involved in it. And I also think that um, one of the trends that I see, Andy, especially in an academic institution, a, a place like Houston, is that so many of the academic institutions, the, the teaching centers are now including global uh, medicine as part of their curriculum. So there's just this whole wave of, of people interested in global medicine and global health and I think also I'm very encouraged by people that are now interested in not just the small putting on band-aids and, but they're interested in the big picture and addressing poverty and the diseases of poverty and the problems of poverty from a, from a whole different broader view. And that to me is very, very encouraging. Can I tell you one quick story I thought about when I was uh, considering these questions, I heard about, um, a village is kind of a, a fable or a metaphor, but I heard about a village in a remote part of the world and and it was by a, a river. And all of a sudden one of the villagers saw a baby that was drowning in the river and he ran out there as quickly as he could and he saved the baby. And no sooner as he saved that one baby, then all of a sudden more babies were in the water. And all of a sudden the whole village was out there and they were rescuing babies because they were just coming down downstream and all these babies were about to drown. And about four or five hours into rescuing babies, two of the people of the villagers, they just, they went up, they went off to the bank and started walking off. And the villagers said, where are you going? These babies are drowning. And they said, we're going upstream to find out who's throwing them in the water. And I think that we need people that are, that are rescuing babies, but we also need these broad thinkers like the Bill Gates and that, that group of people that are going upstream 
And, you know, they're looking at it from a big picture uh, standpoint. And I think that's so necessary. And I'm believing that, you know, God's going to give these people great wisdom as they address these issues, not just from saving babies, but from the big picture. You know, one of the things that um, we have been working on for the last year is uh, looking forward 10 years. And we're seeing, uh, if you look at the statistics, you mentioned Bill Gates. So the wonderful thing, the wonderful message that very few people get to hear is that our generation has solved some of the world's biggest problems. The four biggest communicable Absolutely. diseases, HIV, AIDS, uh, hepatitis, TB, and malaria are well on their way to becoming solved, yeah. which means for mission organizations, a mission yeah. hospital, their whole agenda is going to change from serving, you know, chronic immediate emergencies to, to long-term or sort of non-communicable diseases to long-term chronic diseases like yep. good old Americans have, you know, heart disease and uh, kidney and liver disease and cancer and trauma and all those kinds of things. And so there's really going to have to be a shift in a lot of the mission hospitals. Uh, very interesting opportunity. Um, where do you see the opportunity around things like M3 and getting people involved? And uh, if you had a wish, what would that be? Uh -oh. Sorry, Andy, you cut out there. Just say it one more time. <laughs> so, oh, OK. Uh, no, I was going to say, what's, what's your sort of your long-term wish or plan for M3? Where do you see that going? You know, I just hope we can engage more people's hearts, Andy. I think that's the key that I want. Just to, I, I tell everybody often, uh, I'll say that what I what I want M3 to be is I want people to know what I didn't know about when I was in training. I had no idea about medical missions. I had no idea about mission hospitals. I had no idea about the opportunity. So I wanted to just grow and take on its own form and do be whatever God wants it to be, but mostly just to expose people to the idea of medical missions and engage as many hearts as I can, especially that young, the young people, the, the people less than 25, because you know what, they're the, they're the future. Paul and Andy, we're starting to get some questions in uh, and I'd like to invite our, our viewers, if you have a question, uh, please feel free to put it in the chat bubble or in the comment section on Facebook Live and we'll do our best to uh, uh, get to them. So Paul, a couple of questions that are coming in from some of our viewers tonight, yeah. one is, um, a question about, uh, you talked about this generation really giving their lives to causes. And the question is, are you seeing that mirrored over in countries like Malawi and Kenya and Uganda? Are you seeing that same type of um, commitment and interest in, in, in taking responsibility? Uh, uh, for the local congregation, the yes. local people, you mean? Yes. You know, I'm just going to tell you, Patrick, that I think one of the greatest wealths in the world are the people that I work with in Africa. They are so smart. They're brilliant. They're so resourceful. And they have a passion to reach their own people. You know what? They, they don't all want to be brain drained and come back to the United States or the UK. They want to do something in their own country. And so I see the same passion that we see of the kids over here. I see it over there. And they're just so, so bright and so energetic and so wanting to learn. So I'm very encouraged because really the, the local people, that's just the, that's the sustainable effort that we need to be involved with. We, we have to be involved with teaching and then leaving, so to speak, teach them how to do it and then let them do it on their own. And so I'm very encouraged by the passion and by the, and especially many of these young men and women are passionate followers of Jesus. And they want to not only do missions, but they want to do, I mean, medicine, they want to do missions and they want to reach their people for Jesus as well. Well, that's wonderful. Speaking of uh, uh, that faith component, we have one of our churches that's viewing tonight and they were talking about how they've been moving uh, more of their commitment to medical missions specifically. And their question is, from your perspective as a surgeon and a pastor, what are the types of programs that you see that will bring financial stability to some of these international hospitals and clinics? Well, I think, um, you know, 
them working on a model of sustainability themselves is 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 the key. But I what I like to do, Patrick, I don't know if I can answer it in totally, but I can tell you what we like to do. We like to come alongside organizations that are making a big difference, especially mission hospitals that are making a big difference. Mm -hmm. Sometimes $2,000 a month can make all the difference in these mission hospitals being able to reach the people that they're reaching or close their doors. And so I'm telling you, it doesn't take a lot of, of, of giving a lot of uh, resources to help these, these mission hospitals. So I, I very often will target mission hospitals that have been making a difference for 50 to 75 years that just need a little help, all the while working toward sustainability on their own. Very often though, Patrick, and you, you know this because I'm sure you've seen it and been there, but these are very poor people we serve. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like they have a lot of resources and the government often does not help with a lot with, with uh, healthcare infrastructure. So I think just a little bit of help for some of these sustainable efforts like Mission Hospitals goes a long way. And that's where we at Lakewood put a lot of our money right now toward helping these institutions like that. Okay. Well, our special guest tonight has been Dr. Paul Osteen, missionary and associate pastor at Lakewood Church. Paul, I want to thank you for, for um, your years of sharing your talents, um, sharing your skills at mission hospitals all over the world. Sure. And I th <laughs> that's right. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. And listen, we, we pray blessings over MBF. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Right. We look forward to seeing you at M3 here soon. All right. God bless. <laughs> well, our next program is Tuesday, August 4th, 2020. Andy, we've got another great uh, discussion lined up. What do we have uh, on uh, on the table for that night? Well, well, Paul will appreciate this. I'm sort of a hospital nerd, so to speak. And, 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 and Paul's like that. When, you walk, when we walk into a hospital, we sort of wander around and try to see what's there. It's, you know, it's like fun, you know, actually fun going someplace and seeing how they're constructed and how they're built. Well, next time we have a special guest, Dirk Anderson from Engineering Ministries International, who focuses entirely on yeah. building uh, mission hospitals, uh, clinics, all types of uh, projects uh, all over the world. And they're a ministry that specifically focuses on uh, those kinds of things outside the country. And um, he's going to be with us to talk about what are the critical elements that you need to think about when you're starting a project like that. You just can't just hire some guy and start putting down concrete block. Sophisticated medicine requires a lot of thinking. So he's going to talk about that. Then later on in the month, uh, it's our uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Lisa Alianello. Uh, Lisa is the new director of the Center for Global Nursing Development. So she'll be with us later on in August and tell us about the new uh, efforts and the things going on with the center. Thanks so much, Andy. Well, it friends, gets if every week, <laughs> this is going to be a pretty tough act to follow, Paul. Oh, I tell you what. Uh, <laughs> Um, if your uh, giving to your church has been impacted by COVID-19, uh, we'd like to invite you to join the dozens of churches that have tapped into a free MBF resource. It's called the Guide to Reigniting Congregational Giving, and it includes 10 steps to address the current challenges uh, that COVID has brought and how you can come out stronger on the other side. Uh, again, this is a free resource based on years of experience in working with uh, churches and church stewardship. And if you'd like to access the several articles and resources that have already been published, you can go to our website, medicalmission.org, medicalmission.org, and click the picture of the church pews that reads 10 Ways to Reignite Congregational Giving. And while you're on the website, if you've missed one of our previous discussions on Medical Missions Live, you can get caught up. Just go to medicalmission.org and click on the media and resources button, and you'll see all our shows listed right there. Friends, Paul wrote in Acts 20 that his only aim was to complete the task that he was given, and that was to testify to God's grace. And if you would like to join MBF in testifying to God's grace in your life, we ask that you consider a couple of things. First of all, 
will you join us daily in praying for our international partners and in praying for missionaries like Dr. Paul Osteen? Your MBF team begins each day together in prayer, and we ask that you join us in that practice. And secondly, if your values align with what you know about MBF and what you feel we're, how you feel we're, we're developing the sustainability model for international medical missions, then we invite you to be a part of the miracle that God is performing in our partner countries. When you go to medicalmission.org, click on the donate button at the top of the page because every dollar that comes into MBF is multiplied by God and it becomes $5 of medical service to the least and the lost. We thank you in advance for your generosity. And we hope you'll join us next time for Medical Missions Live on Tuesday, August 4th, 2020. And don't forget to invite a friend. Thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve alongside you in ministry. May the God of grace and peace go with you.